So I'm delighted to be here, and uh, we do want to hear from the audience uh, as we go along. Uh, so the, the, the program tonight, uh, a couple of things I, I will do just at the beginning. I would like to acknowledge the Yorgenji people, who are the traditional custodians of the land. I'd like to pay my respects also to their elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who are present tonight. Um, I, I did want to uh, recognise also the people who sponsored the organisation which is sponsored tonight. Uh, the Planning Institute of Australia, Farmer of Queensland branch, has uh, been certainly one of our sponsors um, tonight. Um, the the um, now how do I say this again? Trop Tropico, Tropico, yeah, Tropico, which is basically the James Cook University Sustainability Program has. Uh, been very generous in allowing us to use this space and, and giving a lot of resources. And most of those people who were at the door, I think, were the students uh, from the facility too, so great work there, guys. And, and last but not least, certainly, is, uh, is the Cardiac um, Challenge um, uh, Incorporated, um, who are have actually financially sponsored tonight as well. And I would like to just ask Greg to assess Allen from um, that organisation to come up and say a few words on behalf of the sponsor, Cess. Yeah, yeah cool. We've got a mic here somewhere. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, Cardiac Cycle Sync is a non profit group. The form is part of the property of lifestyle, fighting activities. Can you speak up? <coughs> the 
blocking activities and gains rate. Um, the place of the Atlas Fork is very important for them. The Bain Society is enjoying the cycles um, using the road bikes and dedicated bike infrastructure in the local and wider regional areas. The primary focus of the group supports training rides and fundraising activities associated with the hospital foundation and others. Um, it serves to support riders to prepare the safer day of commuting as well as more. Homeless rivers of charity rides all across the far north. Also, I can see you can wear the home and that's why it's so interesting. Um, the hospital foundation is, is um, I suppose, a very, very keen supporter of beginning rides as well as um, more experienced rides. And so, um, for those who are unaware, every Sunday morning there's a training ride that arrives from the Seabreeze Cafe. The hospital, so um, we encourage you to have people come along who are interested in, in cycling and start participating in that. Um, the cardiac challenge is probably the most recognisable of the charity rides, and this is um, the event that we place the most focus on. The event this year will accommodate 350 plus riders um, riding between Cairns and Cook County over two days. Um, they're expecting to raise in excess of $400,000. Um, the cardiac challenge is the anti fundraiser um, for the Cairns Hospital Foundation, or Hospital Foundation, made for the final reason, and serves to raise funds specifically to meet gaps in cardiac care for far north Queenslanders. Um, for those who, who um, contribute to that funds, um, should be aware that all the money raised um, by the Hospital Foundation stays in far more Queensland, which is a very good force. Um, and it's one of, I suppose, one of the few charities where you can most certainly get the money next to stay in the community where it goes. Um, as you would all agree, cycling is a very liberating activity and has many benefits for the individual community as a whole, and increasingly providing a smarter, healthier, and more environmentally effective means for the short and medium term travel. Um, the larger sections of our current and future generations of people. We encourage you all to continue your commitment to the activities like the most forums. Um, we see this is very important. Um, cycling is becoming, I suppose, much more in the headlines. Um, and hopefully it will continue to do so for the right reasons rather than the wrong reasons. So um, these sorts of forums we hope will lead to improvement of um, future and current legislation um, and, and all other organisation activities that directly or indirectly affect the safety and attractiveness of cycling um, as a legitimate alternative to regular individual transport needs in the community. That's probably about all I've got to say, I think. Um, welcome. Please um, enjoy your time here at the moment. And, um,
there's the right place. So, um, you know, part of tonight might be about you as a community working out what messages you want to take to that, that opportunity. So um, that's really what we're here for tonight. The format that we're going to adopt is that um, each of the speakers, and I'll introduce them as we go rather than at the beginning, um, and we'll have about five minutes just to give a different perspective on this topic of Save the Together. Um, and then uh, we'll have a sort of a more open session where we can have some interaction and uh, some, some ideas. And there are people in the audience who have some specialist knowledge that, that I've been briefed on too, so we hope we can um, involve them. So, how's that sound, everyone? Don't be all that excited at the moment. We like to get off talking in these drawers, but that'd be nice. So, why don't we do that? Um, so, our first speaker is. Uh, is the, uh, as I said, the CEO of Bicycle Queensland, Ben, and uh, Ben has a long history of uh, being involved in cycling over many, many years, and uh, a, a very, uh, very much uh, well-respected voice of um, cycling, the cycling as a, uh, an organisation, sorry, as an activity in the community in Queensland. Um, I think there's a little bit of information if you read a bit more about Ben, so I'll just hand it over to Ben. Thanks, Greg. Is that better? Yeah. I did intend to stand, I always like to stand when I talk, but I foolishly put my notes onto my uh, iPhone, so I can't handle two things at one time. So I'll quickly speak about who we are. I think everybody uh, needs a bit of an introduction because you get an image of who somebody is, you don't really know. I'll, I'll do my best in a few minutes. Bicycle Queensland is 30 odd years old, uh, 15,000 people are financial members and put money in the joint. Um, 30,000 don't, quite us, anyway, <laughs> that's fine, I'm only joking. So we have 45,000 people who communicate with us, what we say, 15,000 very regularly with magazines and information, and uh, the key thing what we do is uh, we advocate on behalf of our members and our friends and others. So we don't really care if you are a member or a friend, we still try to look out the interests of people who ride bicycles. We also do insurance for members only, uh, so they follow their bike or they uh, want the car hurt themselves or hurt somebody else that needs insurance cover as they get. Um, and we do, we do events which are fundraisers essentially or profile raisers. Um, and the, the dirty word of advocacy is that um, like our friends at the RACQ, where the board of group are often in the room with government uh, with a suit on, uh, trying to look uh, like we belong and saying the cycle. We're passionately um, In terms of cans, uh, state government is our major focus. Uh, I, I can't deny we deal on a daily basis with the Brisbane City Council because it's the biggest council and we often look at it as a bit of a litmus test. If it gets things right, it often spreads through uh, the, the regional council organisations to get other things happening in other councils. But in terms of what we can do in cans, I'm sorry we don't have a branch office. Uh, we can't give all of those. We come here for events, or we come up on a, a needs basis from time to time, we're just planning things exactly. But we work on the state government not to do things in Brisbane, but to do things in Cunnamulla, or Cairns, or anywhere in between. And we're really pleased with the Queensland uh, Cycling Strategy. We hope the new government will embrace it. Today it said it will. So if you're not aware of that document, I know it's boring, but there's a physical document out there called the Queensland Cycling Strategy. And it covers things that we're talking about tonight, both in relation to cans and safety. So that document is what politicians should and need to know about. It was created under the previous government. Today, Minister Emerson said he's supportive of it. <coughs> um, similarly, we've got what I'm extremely proud of is the state government policy for cycling on state controlled roads. <coughs> now, that doesn't mean council roads, it means a state controlled road. When they build it, it has to have some cycling imprimatur and some facility for bike rides. Bike rides. So that could be a bike lane, which we believe statistically saves lives and increases participation. Or, frankly, if you think better, I know we go down well with everybody in the room, but we want separation. We want the opportunity for people to be able to ride from A to B on a quality facility. We need separation. Um, next, Kansas active. But it's in a good place with the cycling network plans that you've got. Um, <coughs> plans with both the council and state government have a network plan. Look, we've beaten our head against a brick wall for years with council, with government, with transport, with main roads, and we say, well, look, there's no plan. We don't know what you want to be done. So it wasn't until we could get things in place like 
a cycling policy for what you do when you upgrade a state control road, or a cycling policy for when you upgrade the highway, the Bruce Highway going through a, a town, that you need to have a cycling component in that. A uh, bit of a work in progress to see how the new government's embracing that one, but to date the words have been pretty good. So we we know that the as, as they say the money is not there, the cupboard is empty, apparently. But nevertheless, uh, we're getting some reasonable cycling outcomes that we hope to get more in the coming years. Um, all these realities about programs and pieces of paper and documents, I know they just get thrown in the bin when you have, as you've had, an over-propensity for tragedies, and they they still upset me enormously. I attend courts, I meet with families, and it's, it, it will never rest easy. And it's, it's a, a sleepless night sort of thing, you know, you've got to meet the family of a bereaved. I know that that's very close to a lot of people here. So, it, it, nevertheless, we have to keep, from our point of view, we try to keep the policy. If we build it better in the first place, it's less likely to happen. It's cold comfort, but it's, it is our priority. Um, Canyons, we really dig because it's a place that just does it. You know, it's not up here, we're not up here, I've got to admit. You're doing it, you're riding bikes, and that's fantastic. And again, I don't mean the people in the room, but it's probably the ones who aren't. It's the language students who are in here riding on the wrong side of the road as they come from another country. It's the families who are just trickling down to the beach. It's a commuter who's got the backpack and the, the uh, cargo shorts riding. It's just great that Cairns is the leader in the country, uh, behind, according to your, your newspaper, just behind Darwin, as a place where you've got the highest cycling news. So you really deserve to get credit and money back in place all that. Uh, I know you've got a good riding culture up here. There's pros and cons of that. It might sound controversial, but in our office we ban the word cyclist. Don't use it. I know that our board member over there has already. Uh, we call for about people who ride bicycles. Essentially what we want to get is safety from behaviour change. And that's the toughest gig that we, we do all the time. How do you change people's behaviour to get them onto bikes or get, to get them to appreciate bikes? In a word for us, infrastructure is number one. But uh, I've said enough, uh, and I'll probably get a chance to answer a question or two later on. So back to you, Greg. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Tom. Really, I was just to give a bit of an overview of Vice President and the perspective of Keynes and his auto scene. So that was really good. Thanks, I got a message about being a person who rides a bike. I'll make sure I use that language in the future just to see you um, so, um, yeah, I guess a couple of things I neglected to say at the outset. Uh, two, two things that are really important. I guess what we were hoping to get out of tonight, what the organisers would really like, is some concrete actions so that as a group here tonight, we can perhaps get some sense of a few things that we think we're able to be able to do to do something to make a difference in this region uh, for making the, uh, the road safer. So uh, just keep that in your mind as we go along. Uh, we have got people uh, taking notes uh, to try and capture what's being said as we go, and that will be useful, I think, later on to try and pull that together. So that would be one of our ambitions tonight. Um, the other thing which is really important is if you're in social media, the hashtag for tonight is Safer Together Cams. That went over quite a lot of it, but it should be around the So uh, but, but, uh, we will have a conversation going on Twitter, I'm sure. So, uh, uh, speaker um, is tonight is uh, Sean Sampson from the Angie Gillette Foundation. Sean's come all the way from, well, actually, the headquarters in Melbourne has come from Perth today to, to be here with us tonight, so that's a fantastic effort. Uh, Sean, and, and Sean's just going to talk a little bit about the role of the Foundation in making our own safer and Canaan's role in that, so welcome, Sean. For those who don't know, Amy Gillett Foundation was uh, initiated after the death of Amy Gillett, the Australian cyclist who was uh, died of a collision in Germany while training. No, sorry, that Germany? Mm -hmm. uh, so our main goal is to create a safe environment for all bicycle riders, whether they're <coughs> elite riders or you know, just riding to school. It doesn't matter if you're age, type of wheels, whatever you're doing, if you're riding bicycles, we want to make the environment safer for you. Uh, we have a manifesto which sort of covers the steps we want to progress to all the length of aspirational goal of zero by events. It's usually an hour of meditation, but here's the life of version. Um, some participation across Australia has been increasing from 2001 to 2010, 45% uh, increase. 
Fortunately, there's also been an increase in injuries and deaths. Uh, an average of about 35 deaths a year. This year, we've already seen 31, tracking almost one a week, and, and one is too many. At the moment, we're tracking for a year of 50 deaths nationally. So no words for it. Uh, almost 20% of people injured on our roads, seriously, uh, as a result of uh, land transport accidents involved cyclists. In terms of participation levels to injury amounts, that's grossly out of proportion. Um, so that our main focus is obviously to target those areas and find them. As Ben mentioned, off-roading structure is fantastic. I mean, if you're off the road and away from cars and traffic, it greatly increases the safety. The reality is you can't have an off-road path from every door to every door. So although the construction is fantastic, our particular focus is, is on the driver behaviour and the motorist attitude towards cyclists on those roads. So there's three basic steps we want to put to you and hopefully that will lead to uh, zero deaths. First one is three critical factors. Safe vehicles, safe roads, and safe roads at all rates, safe speeds. There's a lot of funding, a lot of government initiatives, a lot of research into all of it. Our focus is on safe people and what we can do in particular to improve the now and the future. Uh, Andrew Gill Foundation is joint partner with Cycle Australia and Hostcycle, which uh, implements training skills for, for, for school students around the country, about teaching them the basic skills of handling your bicycle, um, stopping, how to ride safely, how to anticipate the life and the to have when riding your bike. That's also to give parents the confidence that their kid knows how to ride. In Queensland, you've got the luxury of being able to ride on the path at all ages. In Victoria, once you get 13, it's illegal to ride on the road. I don't know too many parents that want their 13 year old daughter or son riding a bike in school on the road. So, as a result, participation of the kids is just like a uh, drop away. You still have a weekend recreation bike, but the day when the parents are riding at school, it's just not there anymore. It was decades ago. Um, one of the other issues is to look at the way bicycle education is put, input into uh, driver license testing. The type of questions, the volume of questions, and the way the questions are worded to try to create a uh, thinking process in the heads of people more aware of what uh, cyclists go through when they're on the road and how they can track the car. <coughs> Second element is to work together. And I've got to say, Ken's been fantastic in that. Four uh, hours is the worst case scenario. You guys have pulled together, um, led by, largely by uh, Mac Advertising, who have just leveraged everything possible to create some awareness and get the message out there that bicycle riders will need space. Whether there's, you know, a like a club warrior or a kid riding for school, just give that space. Give them some burden, get around. <coughs> not slow you down by a second or two. But it's not going to destroy your day. Just slow you down and be safe as you move around. So I'm just going to go through quickly. Uh, some of the that's some of the awareness impacts that you guys have put together in your hands. Uh, and coming from a small six member company organisation down in Melbourne, it's been really inspiring to see the way things put together to really promote a message. Um, so right through from the obvious strategy, right through to the enormous amount of media saturation message we're getting. Um, we obviously have a specific interest in promoting the media as message, but more broadly it's just the safety environment message. You might have seen some of these uh, billboards and signs. Uh, this one's from, uh, I'm not sure what the road is, but may not be able to come in. It's common, it's going to be seen by everybody coming in, whether you're a tourist, a local, a cyclist, just someone passing through the area, it's there, it's hard to miss. On buses going through town, they're always there, and as a cyclist, buses, not necessarily your best friend, they're like next to you, so it's a secret message on the side, but it is this encouraging. And of course, the public. I mean, the next step is to find consistency across the states. At the moment, there's no state has legislation for a minimum passing distance. There's, you can see that have recommendations. Uh, Queensland and ACT are the only two states that don't have a recommendation for a minimum passing distance. And I write for the other two states, state and territory, they currently have inquiries underway to look at that specific issue amongst the large part of the area. So, we want to sort of say, well, it's been a recommendation, it's clearly not working, how can we go forward from here? How can we make it more effective? How can we change it to ultimately save lives that are being lost? We did talk to David Black about the media matters. Some people come out and say, well, how is this system going to work? It's not a fix. It's a minimum recommendation of riders, etc. 
the initiative to try to change the driver attitude so that when you see the cycles, a meter is an easily recognisable distance. Uh, so there's a lot of US states that have three foot ball in place. The obvious argument of that is how do you enforce that? There's a great example from Austin, Texas, uh, where they've been realistic in enforcing it. Uh, they've had undercover police officers riding along sections of the road, showing them any bike markings that are known to connect between the cycle route. And if they, if they can reach out and touch the cars as they go past, they ready to repeat the following and pull the car over, right they need to get a warning or a ticket issue. And it's creating that behavioural change so that when the drivers might pass the next time, they see the cycles and they seem to think, oh, hang on, I need to do some space. And they might not have the knowledge of what a safe distance is if they've never ridden the bike, so they might think past the way it's safe. But to create that change in mindset that no, you need to give significantly more distance, that's a significant step forward in, in terms of enforcement and a safety and awareness of cycles. There's a few bits and buts that come up in the argument. I have to go through them. They're common. They always come up. I'm sure they'll come up again tonight. Um, but there's answers to all of them. If you can't answer them, then this is what this forum is for. We're ultimately here trying to have your feel safe for the ride and ride. And if you have a question for us that we can't answer, that means we need to go back to the drawing board to ask them some more questions. Ultimately, here just to fly our lives and be safe doing so. Next on the list, uh, we've gone from, uh, I guess, uh, organisations that, that are, whose role is to look after cyclists to, to what I well, guess began as a motoring organisation. So, Steve Swalling from RACQ is an expert, he's Executive Manager Technical and Safety Policy for the RACQ. They don't be doing some great work on this issue about safer roads. And I guess um, the RSTQ's position that they really do support making the roads safer, and Steve's just going to tell us. If you, if you get a chance to read their submission to the inquiry, it's a really good read. It's only a few pages, it's very good background if you want to know a bit more. And uh, Steve, so welcome uh, for five minutes for your podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll stand as well, thanks. Uh, first up, uh, I do drive a car, I do drive a motorcycle. I have ridden my fish bike three times this year, and it has an electric motor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, first up, thanks to the organisers for putting this on and the opportunity to come along. I think this is a great opportunity, a real opportunity, where uh, a particular issue can be focused on, and with the right uh, effort and the right, uh, I suppose, focus, you will get results. And if there is a good organisation behind uh, with the road action uh, group, and they have Good progress over many days, I think, so can be for the outcomes. Uh, it's an opportunity to make the roads in the camps area safer. Uh, about us, uh, we obviously are representing some 1.2 million members. Those members ride push bikes, ride motorcycles, drive cars, drive trucks for a living, uh, maybe a professional driver or a casual driver, so all sorts of people, including those that simply walk still use the road network. Um, from our point of view, uh, our advocacy is always about safety. Uh, safety underpins everything that we do we can make mandatory. Our advocacy is to continue pushing the, the importance of safety. Uh, and I think on that it's, it's worth just reflecting that there is currently a decade of action. There's currently a decade of action. It's a global, uh, it's a global uh, program. It's been running now for just over two years and it is made up of a whole range of localised product uh, projects such as these. If you get an opportunity, just uh, go on the website or Google Decade of Action and you'll see all the good stuff that's happening. And to put it into perspective, I just picked up some numbers earlier on. Um, 3,400 people lose their lives on golf roads every single so if you think that there's around 100 dollars in the room here, uh, over the next hour, we will entirely clear this room out based on the rates in which people die. Works out to about um, two persons per minute. That's the rate that people die on roads for a whole range of reasons. Uh, vulnerable road users make up half of the global road time. So again, we've got major problems 
not just about people, he comes to the dark and precious. And it's a whole, whole load of other numbers. Um, 175 is the greatest hub in Queensland that I've ever seen. And it's up from last year, up from the year before, and it's up from the year before that as well. Um, so God Jesus, a phone call for Jesus, saying, all right, it's here. Uh, and I think uh, there is a changing uh, place of my will. Uh, we are moving from a very much a car centric world to a whole range of what will be future mobilities. It's like at the moment, we've just seen the introduction of segways, but there will be many, many other new technologies that come along. So, this is one of transition. So, over the next decade or so, we will have to accommodate a whole range of what will be new modes of transport. Uh, and in doing so, we've got to share the road. And to share the road, we can to see and to sort of coexist in some fashion. Uh, and in doing so, there will be rights and responsibilities of all the road users. So we, we all have a right to use the road, we have a right to expect to use that road safely, but we have a responsibility to make sure that we keep those around us and ourselves safe as well. To do that, we certainly need to put a so everybody knows what they can and can't do. But it really comes back to the behaviours that will make people um, stay safe and coexist in that same fashion. <coughs> so from our point of view, the submission that we put in is very much based on our road sharing <coughs> behaviour um, and the policy of some way. And one that really can be achieved if we have good education programs in place that will and advise people so that they understand what they need to do and how they can contribute. Uh, there are other solutions, obviously. We will probably come to cover those at the end, so I won't cover those. But uh, uh, we are we're, we're pleased to be part of the discussion and we're going to just take the organisers the opportunity to come on <laughs> I was given this to uh, slow you down if you're if you need to, to stop and be useful. So I had to get the deep performance indicator there. Well done, thanks very much. Uh, so it is great to see an organisation that comes from a motor and sort of representative group uh, to be thinking much more broadly. So uh, excellent. Look, I know we've got a bit to get through, and you probably want to ask some questions and things, but I don't want to open up with the discussion that we've heard from everyone, because I think once we do that, we'll probably have a long discussion. So we'll just keep going through if you can bear with us. Um, so next up is uh, Professor Bob Stinson, who's in the front row here, uh, Tropical Leader in Education for Environmental Sustainability. Uh, Bob's going to talk about his experiences with cycling in Cairns and the importance of our cycling, ed uh, the importance of cycling education. And Bob is, Bob is uh, confined to the chair as a result of a cycling accident, which he'll probably tell us a little bit about. So welcome, Bob. This is your this is your home turf, and uh, so we're very pleased to have you here. Yeah, as Greg um, indicated, I'm not exactly a uh, walking, or in this case, non-walking advertisement for uh, cycling safety. Um, but in my case, my accident, um, which created a uh, spinal injury, um, was not caused by a recalcitrant motorist, um, or not a lack of poor infrastructure, um, but my own uh, in inadequate uh, bike uh, maintenance. So I guess there's a lesson there for um, cyclists in um, picking up your um, um, bike maintenance. But on the other hand, I was wearing a helmet. Um, had I not been, I probably would have had um, break it. So at least I got um, one out of two things um, right. But in terms of um, educating about um, cycling safety, um, I've inferred that there are three important groups, and I'm really pleased to see that all three groups have been brought together um, in this forum. And that's obviously cyclists and cycling organisations, motorists and motoring organisations, and planners and engineers who determine, who design and determine um, infrastructure. But what I really want to emphasise is it's not just education about the 
different groups, but the relationships that are created and the um, learning and dialogue that takes place across these three groups. So that's another important step that I want to congratulate the uh, organisers of this forum. Um, um, let me start with the infrastructure. Um, as someone has mentioned, it's my number one priority. Um, I'm not sure if it is the number one, but let me mention that I think the best infrastructure, cycling infrastructure I've seen anywhere, um, is in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And when I first got to my Amsterdam, the thing that struck me, who else has been to Amsterdam? Um, someone mentioned, what struck you with about the cycling in Amsterdam? Bicycle rules the road. Bicycles rule the roads. Oh, utopia, right? <laughs> so, anyone else? There's traffic lights and media. Ah, uh, yes, tra paths. traffic lights and? Median divided cycle paths. Yeah. They're like mini highways. Right. Um, but what struck me first was that no one wore a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see in my, I think, four or five days that one person wearing a helmet. And I thought, why aren't people wearing a helmet? And it's because of the reasons that you just mentioned. There are separate um, cars that are divided by um, cyclists, by concrete barriers, there are separate traffic lights for separate facilities. Um, of course, we're flat, uh, unlike Ken's might have also have something to do with it as well. Um, but I think that's um, a really important uh, example. But this, the issue, not just of lack of infrastructure, but also the issue of poorly designed infrastructure. And on Monday in the City Morning Herald, there was an interesting article that was quite <coughs> stating there is nothing as disappointing as cycling infrastructure, often expensive or space consuming, <coughs> it's not being used by cyclists. And the um, author went on to say, first, it confounds the non-cyclic population, especially if people on bikes are riding next to the infrastructure. What's the point, say the non-cyclists, the motorists who may conduct spending my taxes on stuff that just gets ignored? And of course, as cyclists, we also get upset with poorly designed infrastructure. <coughs> Usually, a reason that's not being used by cyclists, either it takes a lot longer, um, in some cases, um, it's dangerous. So, the author then listed um, a number of what he called epic bike lane failures. And I'm just, his examples were all in Sydney, which is where I grew up, but it also had me running through how many of these examples of. Uh, seen in camps. So when I mention each one, could you put your hand up if you can think of an example in camps? The first one is bike lanes in, lanes in door zones. In other words, there's a white line on the road, it's a cycle lane, but there's also parked cars. Anyone seen that? Ah. <laughs> uh, number two, the disappearing bike lane. <laughs> Uh, the third one, shared use of scarce um, space. Now, the separation was mentioned, but separation not just of uh, motorists and cyclists, but also separation of pedestrians um, from cyclists. So, in other words, shared cycle and walking lanes. Yeah, yeah. Now, in, in many cases, if it's recreational use, it often sort of gets worked worked out, but if people in a hurry, either for uh, fitness reasons or to get to work, then um, that can create problems. Ah, the next one was obstacles and obstructions. Holes in the middle of a park, bus shelters you have to squeeze around, temporary signages that block the way, a number of times to encounter those. Right, again, we've got, yeah, a majority of people are uh, indicating those. Um, and the final one was signal failures. 
where um, cyclists are often left stranded at lights, particularly if there's no cars. Cars are one of the triggers of the lights. Bloody frustrating. Five to ten minutes waiting at a light, the lights are dark. So I thought um, that we have to think about um, not just the infrastructure, but considerations um, of cycling, um, appropriate cycling behavior. So just to include, um, what I'm arguing is that um, motorists need to develop an understanding of um, cycling and what about safe and appropriate cycling infrastructure and appropriate cycling behavior. Um, but I'd also argue uh, cyclists need to be uh, educated about using infrastructure when it is safe, um, just to require longer to get, a, uh, get to a destination, but also when using roads to apply the road rules. I used to get very annoyed at cyclists getting running red lights. Um, I find the cans of majority of cyclists do that. And that, quite frankly, pisses off uh, motorists. Um, I mean, we're not going to get an equal, an equal respect and concern in using the roads as cyclists to be not about the uh, road rules. So, um, if cyclists don't ride down safely, then you get motorists saying, why should I be uh, in traffic um, safely? And finally, um, an item to consider um, from my experience in riding um, to uni in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and that is the registration of bikes. Um, it worked very well in one, it was in a way creating some equity with motorists in terms of registration. It assisted in locating stolen bikes, um, and I thought it worked extremely effectively. So I encourage council. Um, it only cost, um, I think it was ten dollars um, to have a bike uh, registered. So thank you. World record attempt by Trinity Beach State School, Australia. The bike bus is a program that includes parents, students, and teachers riding to and from school in a safe group. On the 23rd of March 2012, 139 students from Trinity Beach State School in Cairns, Australia, rode their bikes to school as part of a bike bus event to set a brand new Guinness World Record most people riding their bikes to school in a single group. Deputy Principal of Trinity Beach State School, Mark Allen, started the bike bus program in 2008, encouraging students to ride their bikes to school. And children aren't able to do all the free things that they used to do um, back when we were kids. So the bike bus enables children to travel safely on their bikes to and from school. Bike bus rides a set route, collecting children through the most densely populated areas. Ever since its inception, the bike bus runs two days a week. Australian National Ride to School Day was the perfect day to set the stage for Guinness World Record in Cairns, Queensland, Australia.
event was used to demonstrate to all schools that the bike bus is a great solution to many of today's problems based around traffic, obesity and much more. Today was just a fantastic success. 639 is the unofficial count and just all these kids out, not in their cars, doing all the wonderful things, smiling with their mums and dads. It's just the best day, we've had the best time. and 
a good idea is a good idea, and once people get the hang of it, it really spreads quickly. So congratulations, Mark, and that was really helpful uh, to the to the big picture as well. So we've got two more speakers. Uh, Marty Lambert is going to come up next. Um, and uh, Marty, I know I actually did some work with her in the meeting last week in the car together. Uh, he's a, a, a basically a recreation planner, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the Ken cycling strategy, which he was involved in. Um, yeah, look, I'm on the uh, National Board of Parks and Leisure Australia, which is a big industry body for parks and recreation. Um, I'm also the Queensland President of the same organisation. Um, essentially, what we're seeing now is that active transport is becoming the answer to so many solutions, uh, so many problems. Um, we've got, um, I guess, a major uh, role in advocacy as part of our organisation, and we're pushing to try and get urban design rethought so that active transport becomes central. And I'm sure there's lots of other people who will talk about the importance of that as well. I was going to go on about um, the benefits of cycling, uh, but when I was riding back from town this morning into yet another headwind, <laughs> why am I doing this? And it came to me that perhaps the top 10 might be useful. So I'm going to give you the top 10 reasons why cycling is good. Number one, and this is my favourite, cycling is four times better than sex. <laughs> In terms of the metabolic rate and the expenditure. <laughs> okay, and um, I am advised that you should never be combined. <laughs> cycling will make you live longer. Okay, there's a Danish study that said cyclists, three hours a week, 30% um, lower all-cause mortality. In other words, if you ride three hours a week more, 30% less likely to die. Um, University of Queensland also um, had a study recently um, which was about physical inactivity. They uh, found that every hour of watching TV can take 22 minutes of your life. So if you're out cycling, not only are you 30% less likely to die, you're going to live longer as well. So get out of Cycling is the new golf. <laughs> All right, it's, it's ahead of golf now. For men, it's now 14.4% are cycling and only 9.8% are playing golf. Okay, it's the third most participated in physical activity for men and the fifth most for women, fourth overall. Uh, it's in Queensland, it's gone up to 11.1% um, compared to a couple of years ago, 8.4%. And in the mega trends that CSIRO have just released um, when they analyse ERAS data and a few other things, they found that there's a 45% increase in cycling um, over the last 10 years. Uh, cycling gets better, and this is number four by the way, the more people who do it. Okay, so the more of us that cycle, the better it is. Melbourne Uni found that if the participation doubles, the risk per kilometre of falls reduces by 34%. Number five. It's fun and it's social, not just because you get to wear lightweight. <laughs> okay, of the 37% of people in Queensland who rode in the last seven days, in terms of the, this era stats again, 69% of them did it for fun. Okay, it's not, um, and remember this isn't inconsistent, sorry, it's not an era stat, that's the participation in the cycling survey, which included under 15s, whereas era only takes 15 and over. Um, Cycling, you meet people, you're engaged with your community, you see what's happening, you're down in your neighbourhood, and as I said, you get to wear light. Number six, cycling saves you money. That's a no-brainer. You save on fuel, you save on doctor's bills, unless you fall off. You save on All-Star, you save on speed tickets. Um, as far as the country's concerned, we save billions on health. Victoria alone, they think cycling uh, is probably saving the health services 227 million a year. There's more of us than you think. People think that cyclists are a minority. We're actually not. Um, nationally, as I said, uh, as I said before, participation in the the um, cycling participation survey. Nationally, 38.7% of people rode in the last seven days. Cairns has got the highest rate of participation uh, of all non-capital major cities. Uh, and we've actually got better equity than most of the other cities too, because cycling at the moment tends to be skewed towards men, 
versus women. Um, nationally, it's 3.3 men to one female cyclist, and Kansas is down to 2.5. So go girls. Let's keep going and get more cyclists out there. Now, this is one for Kevin Rudd or Tony Abbott. Cycling is nation building. <laughs> well, maybe it's nation saving. Look, most of you would know the cost of this plan in our community to our community is phenomenal and it's growing. Um, we've got 60% um, of our adults don't get enough physical activity to generate a health benefit. Uh, it, it could be called a crisis. If I was in politics, I'd say it's an inactivity crisis and we need to do something. Um, it's also good for the nation save, saving because it reduces pollution, it reduces carbon emissions, it saves on roads because it reduces congestion, it reduces um, the, the problems we have with people getting late to work and being unproductive. Um, Queensland alone, in terms of obesity and inactivity, um, it could, the cost of obesity and inactivity is costing $12 billion. Not only that, we've got cycling, which is at the, at the centre of growing tourism and recreation markets. Number nine, cycling is good for you and your community. It builds social capital. It creates interaction, it gets surveillance out in the streets and it reduces crime. It increases local shopping, it increases, it strengthens local communities, um, and you get to meet people. And finally, cycling is good for the economy. Uh, Wisconsin found recently that uh, it generated tourism and recreational cycling, generated nearly a billion dollars an annum. Um, it's saving, as I said, billions of health costs. Um, we've got lost productivity costs alone. Um, from inactivity and obesity of uh, 13.8 billion per annum. And that's lost productivity. So the more people that cycle, the smaller that figure gets. Um, there's also regular riders take less cities um, than people who don't ride regularly. And that saves, um, that those riders who are regularly riding to work are saving our nation $61.9 million per annum. So that's my top 10. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, that was a, an eloquent sort of summary of, of you know, the obvious benefits, uh, but I couldn't help thinking about Mark when you were talking about the community aspect too, and just the, uh, the obvious impacts that's had in that community. Uh, last but not least, at the end of the people, uh, as a consulting engineer, uh, Pat Bogan uh, in Jeff, uh, Pat Bogan Associates in Jeff, Bogan and Consulting. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about engineering solutions for um, cyclists and cans. And you're going to tell us that you weren't the person to put those bollards in the middle of the Thank you, Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Um, I'm going to have to stand over here as well. Um, that's because I've done an all seeing, all dancing PowerPoint presentation. And I'm going to have to work here with Mary. Can I start? Lucy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to work with Mary, and we're going to try and the whole theory is not supposed to know that she's going to change the pattern. Okay, so um, yes, thank you for the opportunity to be in the part of the forum today. I appreciate it. I'm here actually on behalf of Pat Funny. Pat was invited to, to um, present tonight, but uh, he could not make it other people. Um, and uh, certainly I appreciate the opportunity to take his place. As for myself, um, I, I guess the best I'm a social or recreational cyclist. Until about mm, two months ago when I had my bicycle stolen. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, since then I guess my cycling has really been involved about Channel 9, Channel 10, Channel 7, so it's been some cycling here recently. Um, I guess there's an opening statement about engineering. Um, I wanted to say that. In terms of road design and, and road planning, the, the, the concept of providing for cyclists and even pedestrians for that matter in a road environment is actually fairly relative, relatively new for us. You know, I've been in this game about 25 years. And it's probably over the last few years that there's been a real change in, in thought process and pattern and philosophy from a, a road design point of view that, that it isn't just about the freight task, it's not about trucks, it's not just about cars, but it is also about cyclists and pedestrians, and that's been a a real change is starting to happen. The consequence of that is, is that we've spent the last, or the previous 100 or 120 years building nice road infrastructure 
that's inconsistent with those objectives. And therefore, there's a massive legacy out there at the moment that we need to try and build it because it already exists and it's hard so to go back in time and try and change those things. So, I guess what I'd do first of all is um, I want to step back a bit and talk about how many engineer thinks. So, and I thought I'd go back to my old mate Gilbert, who was um, <coughs> Gilbert, I should say, because he's pretty wise in these sorts of things. So, I thought I'd, I'd show you this. What's up already? There you go. And that's how we think. <laughs> okay, so we, we see a problem, and we want to see what is that problem, what, what is the issue, and then we want to analyse it, we want to know what caused the problem, and then we want to find solutions. So how do we fix it? What do we do to make this thing right? And, and all engineers are basically hard by to, to do that. I'm sure Paul Wong, for example, would agree with me, or, or Helix, that's what we do. We're hard, hard by to know what's the problem. Let's analyse it and let's find an answer. So I'm going to walk you through that process that we would go through as, as engineers. Okay, so let's, let's define the problem. The issue we have with roads these days is you basically have incompatible uses in a very unforgiving environment. That's what we've got, it's incompatible uses in an unforgiving environment. So let's look at these uses. Let's look at what we put into this road environment. The first one's these things. They're big. They take up lots of space. They're really slow to accelerate. Generally predictable on the road. They can shoot deep past the road. They like to take up that space. <laughs> and you've got a pretty good chance of, of surviving a collision with one of those big things. At nine times out of ten, you'd probably get by. Then you've got these things. They're a bit smaller than a truck, they take up a bit less space. They don't need as much, much time and space to stop. They get a lot faster to accelerate. That's a bit less predictable on the road, these things. And in fact, they, they think they own the road. And you've probably got 7 out of 10 chances of surviving an accident. Then you've got these. These are a lot smaller than cars and trucks. They're very quick to stop. They're slow to accelerate. They're generally predictable. They like to share the road, but probably about a 2 out of 10 chance of surviving a collision. And then you've got these, the subset of the first lot. And they're often too quick to stop. I don't know what acceleration is. They're often very unpredictable, they actually want them to do, and they've probably got about a 1 in 10 chance of survival condition. So what do we do? We're taking all these incompatible users and we're sticking them into that. So as traffic engineers, they're the sorts of issues that we're trying to understand. That's the problem. So, next step in our process. All remember what that was? What's step two? Yeah. Analysis. And all engineers, when they think of analysis, they think that's a wonderful opportunity to do that wonderful engineering thing, and that's to use a spreadsheet. And what's better than a spreadsheet? But a matrix. And I can see why I'm getting excited about that. So, what I thought is, okay, I need to do an analysis using a spreadsheet and a matrix. So what I've done is I've looked at what would be the outcomes of a collision happening at 40 k's an hour. I've done a very in-depth analysis and I've used highly technical engineering terms to describe the outcomes. So please don't be intimidated by this. So basically what you've got is what happens when a truck collides with a truck, or a truck with a car, or a truck with cyclists, or a truck with kids on bikes. All those combinations and permutations, that's what like engineers like to do because I think they're really smart. And then it's your highly complex and technical analysis of those outcomes. So basically, bugger is worse than ODR, horrible is worse than bugger and ODR, and catastrophic is worse than level three of those. 
So my in-depth analysis is telling you what everyone already knows, that Cyprus is obviously by far the most at risk when it comes to collisions on the road. So, what's the engineering solutions for Cyprus? I know as a, as, a, as, a, as a civil engineer trying to design solutions for Cyprus, I too actually find it really frustrating when we build infrastructure for Cyprus and they don't get used. I've seen that a number of times, is that we think we've got a really nice solution and then I see someone just bypass it or avoid it. And what I've really found is there's really two classes of Cyprus we need to deal with and they both have really different solutions in some respects. So you have your commuter Cyprus, and for them, the solutions are about on-road facilities and about conflict minimisation at intersections, because intersections and stuff is a key issue in terms of accidents. And then in relation to, to your more social users, it's off-road facilities and it's avoidance of intersections as much, much as you can. And they're really the two key issues that we try and focus upon. The good news is, is that from an engineering point of view, I don't have to invent anything because all the solutions are really already out there. All the smarts have pretty well been identified. Uh, the Netherlands, for example, is a fantastic example of where they do some really amazing things with, with cyber facilities. Um, even in the southern states of Australia, they've done some really good stuff. But I just want to flash up some examples of some things. These are for commuter cyclists on road facilities. So that's a classic example of no <laughs> Really good idea. Now, this is also another example of, of, of not good on road facilities in Cyprus. Let's look at some ones that maybe just help a bit. Here's an example in uh, overseas where you're providing for on road bike facilities, but you're providing that separation. So, a very um, deliberate delineation of, of the bikeway and, and, uh, and separation of the through traffic. Uh, again, a similar example to that one. Uh, same again. Uh, obviously, the signage regimes can help in that respect. If you can't provide the infrastructure, at least provide some prior warning. Again, for commuter cyclists at intersections, um, there are some, some treatments that can be done where, particularly on low volume streets, we start looking at some uh, opportunities to provide priority for cyclists and these. these uh, uh, priority treatments at, at intersections where cyclists actually get to queue in front of through vehicles. Um, this particular layout actually allows for, again, the cyclists to be uh, separated from the turning movement, so they separate the cyclists and, and the vehicles before you get to the actual turn movement at the intersection. And then you give the cyclists priority at the turn. This one's the bike box. See this around a few places, and again, this is a, a case of being able to give cyclists the opportunity to, to queue in front of three vehicles. Uh, and this is actually a signalised regime where the cyclists can go up to a, a press button, they want to turn right, and actually uh, have a, a priority a green light movement. Uh, and likewise, uh, uh, in an urban environment, it's a, it's a through lane through intersection. And again, a dedicated bicycle lane through an intersection. So they have their own press button, sensor, and they can uh, have their own signalisation. This one is a, uh, it's a safe movement or not. It's actually an example of this at Fossil Road, I think, in the south side of town, where you've got people trying to get across a acceleration of merge lane. And uh, that's uh, an example of these. So the cyclists, I think the key result, the key um, element of this is really providing off-road facilities. Uh, they want uh, children's ability to be able to operate in a, in a highly trapped environment just doesn't work, they don't understand road rules, you know. So uh, the off-road facility is the way to go. Now, roundabouts, because that's always a very topical thing. And as a traffic engineer and a civil engineer, this is one of my key I believe in terms of trying to find appropriate solutions for cyclists and it, it constantly is difficult. There's actually a couple of different um, schools of thought on this. One is the 
you apply you you have a philosophy of, of separation, segregation from the traffic. And the other one is you actually incorporate in the traffic, so you merge cyclists with the traffic. This is an example um, from over in uh, over in Europe where you actually have a separate uh, sorry. You have a separate cycle lane that circulates around the around the roundabout. Uh, this is uh, over in the Netherlands where the bicycle lanes are separated entirely away from the, the traffic lanes. This is an example over in New Zealand where what they've done is they've modified the existing roundabout on the left. They call it actually a sea roundabout. I prefer to call it an egg about. But um, the philosophy behind this, this type of uh, configuration for the roundabout is actually to force traffic to slow and to enter and turn through the roundabout at about 30 k an hour and then allowing cyclists to merge with the through traffic. Again, this is a different philosophy. We actually separate cyclists from the roundabout entirely. So they come off the road network and they, they cross the side roads to get through. And that's it for me. Thank you.
there any particular questions of uh, of the speakers? Anything that you want to clarify that they said? I don't want to spend a lot of time doing this, but if you have something, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now we've got a we've got a radio mic, so uh, yeah. This is for Alan, do all the children that are taken home in the same way they go to school? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I've got these. Uh, thanks. I've got these uh, white bus stops. They're hilarious if you ever look around them on the beaches. There's 13 of them. They confuse tourists. <laughs> uh, but it looks like a sun bus stop, but it says white bus. On it's got a picture of white. It's quite a common thing actually around Cairns. They're everywhere now. If you're, uh, if you're from here, there's stacks all around the place. But yes, the children just congregate at the white bus stops. So I've just um, created a route which goes along the base of the footpath beside the highway and all the neighbourhoods speed out <coughs> onto the path. So I'll just ride along, we don't even slow down, we just, I just pull out all board and they just jump on as we go. Um, pretty simple really. And then in the afternoon they just peel off, we ride, we ride back to the end point which is 8 kilometres, um, each way south or north, depending on what day, the kids just peel off and they go back to their own streets. Invariably they start their own bike buses. So there's heaps of little white buses happening now. Um, they'll have to roll games and stuff. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but typically with me, it's the big, the big kids at school and then the little tiny cute ones, um, you know, prep year one and two, they are make my main clientele. And then the big ones come along just to be, be in, the, in the cool thing. Is there anything else that requires some clarification or anything? So you might said that you want to know more or didn't understand? No? <coughs> All right. Okay. Look, uh, the first question I wanted to pose to you, uh, to the audience and to the, the uh, people on the panel, is how important is cycling for the Cairns community? And when I say Cairns, I'm including the tableland. Yeah. I mean the region, I'm talking about the Cairns, the broader region of Cairns, not just Cairns Regional Council, but you know, the, the full region. How important is uh, cycling to this region? Somebody said it almost or Sorry to say, it's um, enormously important, both um, economically and, and socially, and also for, um, uh, for the city itself and, and the region itself, the, uh, the, the presence we have um, in the world, uh, attracting major events. I'm sorry, man. Sorry, obviously, but I'll just turn mine off when you're talking, sorry. Yeah, and the, um, you know, events like the um, UCI, um, uh, UCI, World Mountain Bike events and also on Cairns Island and other events such as that. So yeah, yeah incredibly important. Cool. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks very much. Um, I might just throw the Councillor Richie to base uh, on that question. Um, Richie, is there something that you want to offer later or down from this <laughs> to this community? No, look, all, all I'd say is, is Cairns is becoming a, a cycle sport destination, if you like. As John, point, John pointed out before, there's lots of events coming here, but we're, we're building that cycling culture here. Particularly, we've seen big changes in the last five to ten years. We've seen an increase in the amount of infrastructure that we have here. Well, of course, we need more, but we've got we're getting to that tipping point now where there's lots of people cycling in this city. Where that it's a broad church. It's not just one group of people. It's kids riding to school. It's social riders. It's people riding to work or recreational. It's a very big cycling community, and it's very cohesive and collaborative as well. I think that's very important to note, and I think that's why we've got forums like here. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'll just ask Ben Wilson in on this. Uh, the concept of cycling being a broad church, uh, Ben, I know you, you picked up about not destroying myself as a cyclist, but I'm a personal cyclist. And, you know, uh, so would you like to have a explanation? Yeah, just uh, in my short time in Kansas this afternoon, I was totally focused on coming here and saying, what am I going to tell you people? Because I'm not from Kansas. I haven't been here for years, sorry. Uh, but I have ridden through the table twice, and I've uh, kept my eye on what's happening. We've got members up here, we, we get feedback. But in the time we took from the airport, when our client host, Nikki, drove us around and had a quick look at some of the bike facilities, that was between about three and five in the afternoon. I saw one person on bike drive, and possibly 20 in just cities, just ordinary sort of gear. So we, we then went up the dam road and we <laughs> saw everybody in bike drive, <laughs> nobody in cities. So those are the first. 10 or 20 people around the city are getting around. They're hard to reach. 
But they were sort of using the bike paths and they were using the bike lanes and there was one lady using it in the wrong direction, but nevertheless put on the music. And, and that's, I think that's the big thing. That's what you, the, the planners who do this hard work and you know, get disappointed when you don't see them being used. But sometimes you've just got to sit down and have a coffee at a busy intersection and watch the world go by for a while because they are using them and they will come. And, and uh, congratulations on what I saw today. Thank you, man. So you can see that we've got a sort of, is everyone agreeing that cycling is an important thing in this community? It doesn't seem to seem to be pretty, a lot of heads nodding there. Um, there are a lot of uh, women in the room, as I observed at the outset, and um, I would just be interested to know if any of you'd like to offer a comment about um, do you find that impediments to cycling in this area, in this place? You know, is there anything that um, stops you from cycling even though you might like to? Let me be stereotypically feminine and say, like, it's a real pain. Like, you know, like here it's good because they've got showers and stuff because I'm a uni student. But, like, you know, you want to go somewhere and then, like, you're all sweaty when you get there. And then you think, well, I have to take a shower. So you have to take a towel. I have to take, like, body wash and, like, all that stuff. And it's like, oh, I might as well drive. Like, it's just too much of a hassle. You know? So there's a comfort of logistics. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to answer that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I ride every day to work. And yeah, they've got, yeah. Um, I shower in a can. <laughs> <laughs> I change. I, ch I change in my work here. And I have, I have my gear at work. I'll make sure I've got it, got it at work. And even my shoes are at work. Yeah, yeah all that. Take socks. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a problem. I don't have to work without a pair of shoes once, so you can't spare a pair of shoes. Yeah, always good. But the, um, the, the thing I did want to just point out is that we had that view from that discussion about um, cycling being a broad church. I want to get back on this one to ask you a question. But, but uh, um, cycling being a broad church, Lincoln, sorry, cycling being a broad church um, is that really that discussion was about being dressed in lycra or something specialist cycling clothes, whereas what Ben's observation was is a lot of people get into town just doing regular stuff and regular clothes. So one of the indicators I think of the tipping point that uh, Councillor Richie uh, referred to was uh, when you see everyday people doing everyday things in everyday clothes on a bike, then you know you're starting to see a cycling culture emerge. And it sounds to me that like you're just at that point where you're starting to get that. When lycra is a subculture, you kind of made it, I reckon. Um, lady at the back, I think, wanted to offer some observations. Um, as a woman out riding a lot of the time and speaking to other women riding, a lot of women are frightened to be on the road. And I think I speak on behalf of women and men in cans riding. Quite simple things that put, up, put us off riding are the conditions of the bike glass spillage and yep. cracks and potholes. Mm -hmm. Things that I think are quite simple to be fixed in a short term scenario. Um, and also, we, in Cairns, we, we do something, but I tend to think it's not always quite finished. <laughs> For example, a classic is the, um, the bike lane on the Esplanade, which is used primarily by families and tourists. And uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a road rider, so I'm out on the road a lot, but we now have three pathways on the Esplanade. And it would be nice if we could take pedestrians on two of the pathways. Mm -hmm. And for example, like in Brisbane and Sydney, just paint the other one green and bikes only. So that as you're riding down those paths and, and along the designated bike paths, you make them designated bike paths, and just clean up the existing lanes that we've got there. Yeah. So that not only do we have, not have to worry about the traffic, we don't have to worry about the glass. Yeah. So, so if, I can, if I can just sort of summarise, um, there's a safety issue that's one of the impediments, and the safety issue is not only about being in traffic, it's about actually having the infrastructure, but also maintaining it so that it's safe to use. Yeah. Is that, yeah. I but I, I think yeah. what I'm trying to say is I think a lot of people here would agree, I think there are some short, quick fix yeah. situations yeah. that could be taken yeah. care of quite quickly. Yeah, and we'll, we'll make a note of those. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've changed roles. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I grew up in Cairns and moved back here recently 
And one of the reasons I haven't got my bike built from getting off the plane and getting on the roads is because even as a driver, I feel uncomfortable with a lot of the roundabouts in Cairns. Now, I'm going to give one example so you know what I'm talking about. Smithfield roundabout, if you're coming from the north and you need to go all the way around and then back up the range, you actually have to change lanes, which is, when I did my licence, illegal to change lanes in a roundabout. But that roundabout forces you to do that. So as a driver on the roads, if you can't legitimately travel through our systems legally and in a safe manner, how the hell are we going to do it on a bike? Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I struggle with. That's what... Well, thank you very much. I will move on to another topic, but I'll just have one more here. I'd like to add something to that, because I'm from the Netherlands, and on roundabouts we all must change lanes. Um, so we're talking about Holland being an example. So it can be done, but what it comes back to is driver education. And that's a big thing in the Netherlands, you don't just get your driver's license. Most people fail their driving tests, and one of the points that they mostly fail on is failing to look for cyclists. So you can fail your driving exam by one mistake, and that's not looking in your mirrors properly for a cyclist. So part of part of the, the, the you know the driving education is the roundabouts, navigating those, but also looking for the cyclists that have right of way around the roundabout. Yeah. So if you want to leave a roundabout, you've got to be already starting to look where the cyclists are. If they're there, you've got to slow down as you go around the roundabout and change lanes before you leave. I get this what you're saying, but I'm still staggered. You know, that's actually a puzzle shot coming from. But yeah, thanks for your observations. I just wanted to try to, um, well, um, Sean, just on that behaviour change thing. Um, so I did want to, I will also ask our uh, guys in the room to do just a bit of an observation about what they see out on the road in terms of behaviour and any observations they might like to make. Give you a warning. But I'll just ask Sean, you know, a lot of your discussions about this very issue. Yeah, it's a, a heavy focus on, on changing behaviour, um, primarily to uh, motorists understand A, the cyclists have the right to be on the road and how they will react. Um, I guess sitting next to Steve and the counterparts in other states, the natural reaction is think that we don't get on at all. But there's a lot of common issues that we share. No one wants to do it, have a cause in action for the road results in the um, The interesting thing that I learned today was that uh, roundabouts in Queensland has a marked bike lane going through it. Apparently it's illegal to claim a lane and not ride through the bike lane. Is that right? Or is it? Sorry, what? Sorry, what? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. It, it's like, well, the difference is uh, if the bike lane is through the roundabout, we're taught meant to stick to the lane. Whereas in Victoria, we're taught to claim the lane. So if you come up to the roundabout, and some of the, the instructor photos show the lane stands. So the behaviour you're taught to cyclists is to move out, claim the space, and move safely through. Uh, and that leads back to consistency factors. So do the, the education for the riders can't be consistent. It can't be the education for the motorists being consistent as well. And Steve, I know your submission to the inquiry did make like this very point about, you know, there's not much point in Queensland going to money out of some of these things. There's really an international approach on a lot of these, uh, these issues about rules and behaviour. There's, there's really two aspects. One of them is understanding the road use of all road users. Uh, it's, with, it's, un, it's all road users firstly understanding road rules and the things that you understand the road rules and the things that you apply them. But the second aspect is really understanding that there are other road users that you are sharing that road with. So there's really two parts understanding the road rules and understanding the concept of courtesy and sharing the road. I think that's where the real opportunities are, is how you undertake a behaviour change program so that you get people to better appreciate that there is this need to share the road. I think if you're looking for outcomes, what would you like to achieve? What would you what would you like to discuss or what would you like a motorist or some other person that's done the wrong thing you've seen on the road? Uh, whether that be towards you or that you just observe towards another what would you like them to understand better? Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, is that an answer to the question? Yeah, that's not the answer. I was going to give you a... Um, I was talking to a lot of road a car drivers because I, I mix with a lot of people and um, they kept saying how pissed off they were about cyclists. 
you know, doing this and doing that. And I kept saying, oh, well, that's, that's the rules. They can do that. And they can do this. And they... So then I went on to the um, government website where you can practice your license. I did the test 10 times, not one question about cycling. Yeah. So that's something that has to be changed. Depends on the where, you know, it's a requirement in every thing. Yeah, yeah. I have something to add to yeah. that and to, to Jennifer's point. Yeah. Um, it's just that when you take your driving license, you have to learn all those uh, um, rules and laws, but the same goes to children at school. When they're in grade six, they also take a cycling exam, so they are taught how to use the road, uh, how to signal they're going left or right. So I think that's something. I don't know if they do it at your school as well, but it's also correct. Yep. So, so not only in schools yeah. getting kids riding bikes, as Mark shown us, but yeah. actually so getting them to understand them. For both. Yeah. So when they both understand the rules, it's I think also safer also to the cyclists, but also the yeah. Right. So part of part of obviously part of behaviour change is what I'm hearing is education is important and you need to drive that through education. your systems, you know. Yep, yep. Um, gentleman up the back who's asked no, a question. Just like you, uh, road rules. It starts with children. Mark has the beginning of learning children how to bicycle, but they also need to learn how to use signals. And then they drive with the parents and the children sitting in the car, they then also tell the parents about the dad. Children are not sticking their hands up and they're not changing the rules. So I think it really has to start from a young age. I grew up in the Middle East and we, I can't remember, but once a week we all went out on bicycle and we learned to bicycle straight. And that our, uh, so often the public gets confused when a bicycle takes a left or a right turn without a seat. Thanks very much. Uh, you know, it seems to be a pattern. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I did want to ask uh, our police representative, uh, Constable Lincoln. Uh, actually, you have some information about uh, the status of drug um, accidents involving cyclists uh, last week. Do you want to share anything with us? My name is Seaton Constable Lincoln Carroll. I'm from the Smithfield Police Station. Chief Superintendent Paul Carlos, I'm going to ask you about the details of so um, I've got the uh, statistics for the last uh, three years, including this year. Um, the injury accidents um, involving bicycles is obviously the highest of those statistics. Um, the reportable accidents in 2011 were 63 involving uh, bicycle riders in the Cairns area, that takes in Smithfield, Cairns and the Edmonton areas. In 2012, there were 64, so it was around the same. And up to date this year is uh, 43. So we're around uh, the same uh, rate for, for this year. So it seems like it's fairly steady at this stage. Uh, just going through the traffic accidents involving bicycles uh, this year, I had a look uh, through uh, a few, and it's sort of 50-50 whether the car is uh, at fault or the bicycle item. Bicycle riders deemed at fault. When a car's at fault, the main reason is uh, driver inattention and drivers just not seeing the bicycle rider. Uh, and then get, failing to give way at intersections and roundabouts. So that's when cars are deemed at fault. When bicycle riders are, are deemed at fault, uh, the majority of the time they're doing something illegal, whether it's Riding the wrong way on the road, riding across pedestrian crossings, uh, riding the wrong way in a bicycle lane, um, and having no lights on their bicycle. So they're riding at night time with no lights, so no one can see them anyway. Um, yeah, so they're the uh, statistics. So it, it seems like, even though there's more bicycle riders on the road, I believe in Cairns in the last three years now, the the rate of accidents has, has stayed the same at this stage. Um, Thanks, thank you, Ross. Well, it, it, it is interesting. I mean, there's probably some drill in, in that, even though there's more people cycling, the number are actually, so as I've said, it's probably reducing, but nevertheless, there's still people getting that hurt, and then we know that some people are losing their lives. Sean, do you want to that? And I know there's a lady at the back who did also. Yeah. Yeah, I should say, there's actually a study at the Sydney University, uh, and I looked at it, and it's 
does sort of vary uh, the amount of details provided around the states. Um, so they estimated that uh, injury reporting would actually be anywhere from five to ten times more than um, you know, on self boost in the next, which they probably would have gone before, but again, if you do it, had other places to be. Uh, it's not the best reason that cyclists do do it, and it's probably not the best way to pay for cyclists who have uh, injuries and have accidents. But, uh, the fact that you don't necessarily have time to go into the border, you shouldn't track the fact that, you know, as you said, the stats show that the injury levels are staying, staying really consistent. And that's a good thing, because whether um, they're under the border or not, the fact that they are being reported still shows that we're getting injuries, and that's something we can focus on. Try to educate the guys that they don't have access to the border so we can identify where it was, and that can do that in town planning. Thanks, Sean. Buddy, if the actual wanted to make a comment on that, I think. Yeah, Sean, I think Sean actually just addressed it. My question, really, my question was around the fact that they are reportable accidents. Yes. Yeah. Was there any, and how can anybody, be it a cyclist or a, a motor vehicle user, actually feed information into the system to say that there was what is commonly referred to as a near hit? or close to an event so that we can get that data about where it was yeah. and how we might be able to address it. Yeah. So pretty much a short yeah. 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 Is there a way though? Yeah. So, uh, there is a system that the, the police have you can bring up for traffic complaints. So like if someone is turning or driving dangerously, people can bring up and report that. We have the ability for people just to ring up. It's one three one triple four. Uh, that's our police assistance line. If you have a complaint about a driver which was involving you on a bicycle, you can always ring that. And then at least we know about it. It's recorded. Uh, and if uh, if it's serious enough, the police can take action in relation to that. And I know, like, just my own cycling. If something serious does happen, I get a number plate. I just do report. Just ring up. I was always going to give another go. Yes. Yeah. And um, actually, Sue Rayner, she did say to me that it was um, on my life that I had to make sure everyone here knew about this. So, um, the Share the Road, if you go to mypolicecamps.com, there's also a link where you can uh, actually log on and record those new users. It's an initiative that Rich Bates has given um, with Sue. And I don't know, I was going to see your thunder if you want to talk about it. But All right. Thank you. No, thank you for boys. And yeah, and it's another one of those reasons why um, I can't help but feel quite proud about what we've done as a community. It is um, not just a Queensland police initiative, but a CAMS police initiative. And so we're the first community who's actually gone that one step further to say, yep, we, we all have those horror stories, but there's no, until we have the real data, we can't do anything. So I um, think that's a very good question as well, and a really great thing for our community to get on board with. Excellent. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Uh, lady at the back, did you have a, a, another response to that question? Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know that the uh, Senator, Green Senator Scott Luddell has put out an app that's called Bike Black Spots. It's an iPhone app, and you can record any black spots that you've come across, and it goes up. And the more people that put up information about black spots, the more the government can be made aware of, the more we can lobby. <coughs> All Australians can use this app to let the government know just how many people are using bikes, how many black spots are out there. Because we're at a time we're doing, we are in a transition phase here in Cairns, Queensland, Australia. The planet basically are running out of oil. Every bike that gets used is, is uh, you know, oil that's not being used. So uh, there, there is a uh, infrastructure fund in Australia, and I think that we should be lobbying that that infrastructure fund is used to build bike parks. It's the future. What we're building towards is our children. We need those bike parks for our children because as cars become less and less affordable, there'll be more and more people on bikes. If we don't do something about it now, with that fund that's available now, it will be too late later on. It will cost more later. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I'm just going to ask uh, Chief Superintendent Paul Carlo. Just in terms of this question of behaviour of, uh, on the roads, is there any observations you'd like to share with us about your experience over the years? Or? Yeah, sadly, uh, a lot of the stuff we're talking about, culture change, is 
who is an element in society that uh, believes that fair road we see uh, the inability of uh, car drivers to get on with other car drivers and historically motorcyclists have been victims uh, so uh, even with the best of efforts there's still going to be an element out there that uh, and all you got to do is read some of the rhetoric in the newspaper where there's almost a general hatred uh, between some members of the motor community and bike riders, and I think it's probably fair to say uh, likewise for some bike riders. One of the things that will change the culture, and, uh, and it's been mentioned here, the, the economic benefits, the recreational, the social benefits. Uh, what's amused me in my time in Cairns is that uh, the whole community doesn't get behind the economic opportunities. You go to Rotorua in New Zealand, you get off at the airport with a bike and just put your bike together and ride off. Uh, we've got a lot better country than Rotorua, I would suggest. <laughs> <laughs> a lot better opportunities for people than tourists. Uh, you drive into town here as a cyclist and it's populated with coffee shop, there's nowhere to park your bike. Um, so, you know, so if there's going to be any approach, whether it be trying to change the culture, whether it be an engineering approach, a change of the community in general to recognise the, the economic benefits to get behind some of the sporting events that are there, that really needs to be consistent right across the whole sectors. Yeah. And then if you're doing that, wherever everybody goes, they understand that cyclists and cycling is a very important part of Cairns and far north economy and uh, the fabric of the society. And that's when you'll start to see uh, change right across. But sadly, bike riding is still going to be a dangerous activity on roads because we've got a, uh, uh, an element of drivers out there. Not all of them are licensed, by the way. Not all of them are registered. Not all of them are driving. Uh, roadworthy vehicles, some of them are disqualified and uh, they're drunk, they're drug affected. So, sadly. So I guess, um, we've got to, I guess we've got to try and get the majority of the cycling. That's it. And that's doable, yeah. but everywhere they go, they need to see that yeah. cycling is the uh, forefront of community lifestyle. You can yeah. get it. Thanks, Chief and Secretary. I did want to come to Dave in a minute just to talk about that economic uh, opportunity. I know the work you've been in. I did want to go to Steve just to give you an opportunity to talk about you know, this, this whole education thing and the, the drug and the hardcore that don't like. But before I did that, I just when you were talking about Rotorua, I just remember that comedy show that reckoned the New Zealand national anthem with God bless New Zealand and gave them boiling mud. <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> there. Look, I'll just keep my comments very briefly. I think it comes back to uh, there are real opportunities to change the way that people behave on the road. It doesn't mean to say that it's easy. Because it's not. But um, I think if you can do that, then you can make the road network safer and a more pleasant place to be. So I think if, as a group, you know, you're looking to come up with some actions as to something that you can aim for when it comes to targets, what sort of activities or how do you want to focus your efforts on some small area of change? If it is to change people's thinking, change the way that they play or whatever it may be. So that uh, you know the old thing was do something do something small, do something soon, do something successful, you know, to get the ball rolling. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, and I just want just on the question of a bit of interest over there, just wanted to Dave from Hagelin, I just wanted to talk to you for a minute about uh, the, the Chief Superintendent's idea about the economic benefits of cycling in Kansas. So, the Cairns region as a cycling destination. That's probably something we're here to be doing up there, isn't it? Uh, yeah, definitely. Look, circulating around this field is ferocious, so it's a little bit, it's a, a business engagement package that uh, we put together. So I'm involved with a few organisations on the tablelands. And um, probably 10 years or so ago, we spoke to Glenn Jacobs, and know there's mountain bikers in amongst the crowd, and a lot of people know who Glenn is, and World Trail, a company that uh, that he's established over the years. And Glenn was one of the early, early guys in the, the 96 world and an early pioneer in the mountain bike industry here in North Queensland. We had an opportunity, North Queensland had an opportunity in 96 uh, to build what Paul is talking about, like a Rotorua, our own Rotorua here in North Queensland. 
Uh, in around 2001, 2002, I was living on the tablelands and we thought that the upper the tablelands had potential as a cycle tourism destination, in particular mountain biking, but um, we see cycle tourism in, in all its genres on the tablelands being uh, potential. On road, off road, and beside the road, and beside the road is not uh, like uh, divided highways, we're talking about rail trails. Um, so we've been lucky enough to jag a fair bit of money, I suppose. Um, just the end of last year, we picked up $500,000 from the federal government, matched by $500,000 from the state government, topped up by another $250,000 from the state government to build mountain bike trails just outside Athens. We've got 30 kilometres of single track there now, uh, world standard, uh, Inver standard, uh, ready to roll. It's, it's rolling there at the moment. And we've only spent $100,000 million, so we've got a little bit of money to spend, and there will be a lot more mountain bike tracks there. We picked up a couple of hundred thousand dollars to build rail trails, so um, got the nod to do that. Pre the election, we thought we had had it all stitched up. Post the election, the money and the agreements had strangely disappeared. Yeah, so it's Whistler in Canada, which is well known as a, as a ski resort, actually has more visitors in summer than winter now because they took up mountain biking as seriously. So, because of the mountain bikers and the hikers, they actually get more people in summer than winter. So, there's a big economic opportunity here. So, the gentleman here wants to make a comment. I was just wondering, as it may have been talked about in this, but how people are targeting the popular or potentially popular routes. Uh, I mean, the CBD is pretty easy in the type of user in there, but for example, I'd love to be able to go to Douglas, but I don't think it's safe. Yeah. And, you know, people people obviously right up to the dam, but is any work being done to take? Because obviously we can't put bike lanes on every road, and not every road needs it. There's the quiet back suburban streets, for example, where kids are safe, but then there's other roads where you need bike train to get them to those safer places. Yeah. But then there's the popular routes that, you know, soft micro type tourists would love to do and would yeah. be attracted to for. As well, it's like there's a whole lot of tourism there, and you know that they want to do it. it's not in this safe. Community. Yeah. In terms of building infrastructure that people will actually use, is work being yeah. done or has work been done to identify that? Yeah, maybe it's a good question. Is it? I don't know that there's an answer. To the was there anyone chatting on the other day? Uh, oh, oh, sorry. John Crawford. Oh, Jamie, yeah. yeah. John. <laughs> John, sorry. Um, John Crawford, Cairns Regional Council. Oh, you're yeah, sorry, John. I don't know what you uh, council does have a strategy and we have all those desire, desire lines. So we have a network planned. It's going to take about $40 million to um, provide all the infrastructure that we need to, to sort of to build that network. Part of, uh, well, state government also has, Department of Main Roads also has a um, principal cycle network that incorporates a desire line up to Port Douglas, but it's a cost in it's getting the budget to actually build it. So we've done a lot of planning about what we want in the future and where, where the infrastructure should go, but it's actually just funding it. So the, the answer is that people, yes, they are thinking about it, but it's just then about how priorities are and what you do first and what you do second. Yeah. 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 This is the legacy question that Ian mentioned, I think, is that you know some of these things were built before anyone was really trying to cater spiritually to the high school. So yeah, you know, I've asked a few people and they get shuffled around between council and main roads and you know they sort of get handled in the background. Yeah. So Jamie, you happy to have a comment on that? Yeah, I think it's really important to understand that the mountain bike trail network is that obviously is a state controlled road, so they would be responsible for putting infrastructure on that on the bridge. Council has a responsibility for building off road paths like footpaths, etc. But we wouldn't be responsible for putting infrastructure on a bridge. So it does get complicated and it, it does get uh, a bit messy. It doesn't seem to be getting addressed that soon. It's such a big safety issue. Yeah. It, you'll find that that's a very. I think everyone agrees that those are their safety issues. So, yeah, and we know that, you know, that it's, it's all it's that question about how many dollars you've got and what you do first. So, uh, completely understand your, your query. I see a bit of a problem here. <laughs> 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 
So I don't like using the problem, word problem as the first situation. But listen, it's all here. We ride, we're outdoor type people. And we have an interest in cycling, using the roads, getting to from work. There's one gentleman near here, I don't even know if he has a car, because I always see him riding to and from work. But we are all here because we have an interest in that. The people that are not here are the ones that are riding to and from work, getting around town on their $200 Kmart bikes. They're either the low wage earners, I don't know the proper politically correct term, but I'm sure you can figure it out, or their students. They're also the people that I so often see, I reckon six times a week, going the wrong way, up and down the highway, north-south, facing oncoming traffic. Same on bike paths. Monday night, seven o'clock I was going home, two people going north, no lights, I don't even know if they had helmets. The people in town, I said on their $200 Kmart bikes, they're getting to and from work, low wage earners. They are the ones that are riding through the red lights, well, there's a red light in their path and they're ducking down the side street doing a yearly and carrying on. And those people aren't represented here tonight, whether they didn't know about it, whether they felt that it's not for them because nobody will listen to them, I don't know. But we need, as the type of people we are, to promote the right thing to do. Yeah. I don't want to use the word ambassador, but we need to promote that to everybody else. We need to be educators. Now, I think that the Cardiac Challenge team with Glennis, Jude, Pete, and Mark with his bike bus really are promoting that. I've been involved with the Cardiac Challenge a couple of times, and the type of people that it appeals to is those people. The rest of us, we need to, and then for Mark, is developing the bike bus that's taking school age people and right from the beginning, as was said earlier in the Netherlands, these people are taught from school age about road using. And it's not just riding the bike, it's road using. And so we need to take a leaf from their books to try and promote that yeah. to our colleagues at work, to people that we know, hey, I'm you I'm can't do that. I think you've got the general thrust is, yeah. is that, you know, that it's the people that aren't in the room that to a large degree are the people that we want to and that there needs to be a coordinated effort and everyone's got a part to play. So thanks for that. And I really want to get back to that collaboration theme before we finish. Uh, I think that's really relevant to your, your, your contribution, so thank you for that. Gentlemen, do you want to uh, make a comment? Yeah, mate, yeah, um, I'm a truck driver. Yep. My son was into riding push bikes and... Can you speak up, please? Yeah. yeah, I'm a truck driver. I've been driving 26 years. Um, my son took up the hobby of... Um, cycling here in Cairns and he got some advice from a push bike shop on how to deal with the roundabouts and that sort of thing. First time we told him, I think I meant what he was told to do, the road guy he went into in this place was, was pretty full on and he ended up in the middle of the roundabout, had to come to a stop. And um, the things I see is I drive on this track every day in Cairns and it is absolutely chaotic. And the, the level of driving skills are chaotic and by the same token, the push bikes, even though they're doing what they want to do, you really need to be implementing some form of self preservation, even by the road rules. Because what they're doing is really taking a lot of their own, they're into their own hands, you know. Particularly uh, the trucks, you see. Like in the bike lanes, riding along, to a rest in the bike lanes. Well, for a truck driver, because the truck wants to travel around, get over the road for whatever reasons, for me, I prefer single file. And sticking to the yeah, outside sort of the bar lane. So you've got the bar there, drive side of the bar. The other way by the screen in the highway. Um, there's a push bike right there. I was forced out over the centre lane, over the white lines, the oncoming traffic. I'm weighing 42 and a half ton. I have to jump on the brakes, slow right in. There's a bloke there wobbling around on the top line. Just on side of the highway, that bloke around. But this is the sort of thing that's going on. Yeah. And um, majority of people are very good, but there's, you know, I think the most important thing above infrastructure straight up and in the short term 
is to um, yeah, implement self-preservation or something. Yeah. You know? That is really part of it, the way this cultural change. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Until things catch up to the level where, you know. Yeah, really you, you don't do one then the other. You do, you need to do both at the same time, really, don't you? you know? so, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I like fully support cycling, you know, I've ridden my bikes all the time. Yeah. I'm fully aware that, um, you know, um, you, you've got to have a mentality that you don't have to ride away, basically. You've got to be looking everywhere and be prepared for whatever's coming your way, you know? I think I'll, thanks very much, because, you know, I, we have, I understand the point, I think it's well known and reinforced by others who said it today. Uh, I just wanted to go to the panel just to see if there's anything we've covered over the last five or ten minutes that anyone wanted to make an observation on. Um, how do we go for time? Are we, um, we're, we're at 8.30 now. I think we're going to go for another 10 or 15 minutes, or, or are you desperate to get out? Well, put your hand up if you want to go and keep going. How to be a better driver in just three easy steps. Another gentleman, I just sorry. Just just a quick one, a very valid point about what the truck driver contributed then. But you know, when we get this bike education right. Those kids we teach in schools are not just cyclists when they grow up, they are the drivers, the motor vehicle drivers of tomorrow. So they'll respect the road laws and they learn that from a very early age. They'll be better drivers for that experience and of course they'll be better cyclists. I can't, I can't emphasise enough what Mark Allen is doing, the that type of program, the bike bus, the bike education in schools. That's the game changer. And if you get that culture right, that's what drives the other things like better infrastructure and also better road laws. That's the one. Thanks. Look, just in terms of the perspective of, of, I guess, our industry, is it's not just about commuter cycling, it's about recreational cycling too. The benefits for the community, for your health, for society, far outweigh the cost of investment. The, the investment, the return on investment is phenomenal when we look at the costs of inactivity and obesity in our community. But, you know, there's a lot of talk about road riding and riding on the highway, but there's a lot we can gain with minor investment as, you know, Kansas Council Cycling Program has shown, just by getting people out, riding on bikeways, riding to school, riding to the shops, riding locally to take small cars off the road, and as they develop their skills and their children develop their skills, we're going to create a safer road environment when we get to the main roads and the highways as well. So I don't want to forget that the importance of the recreational side. Ben, um, yeah, look, I just stand to say that about 10 years ago, I was in a room very simple of this. It was uh, obviously 12 years ago, I was following Luke Harrop, who was a well known triathlete, he was killed on the Gold Coast. Same sort of thing happened with the parliamentary inquiry. It just took the fan with the government and the, the Premier convened a meeting on the Gold Coast, which I attended. The long and short of the outcome was just like we're talking about, we're really grappling with whether it's behaviour, whether it's collaboration. And uh, I possibly can show it that we, at the end of the day, after meeting, Harry said you were very involved, we were very involved, with focus groups with truckies, with, with uh, the motorist organisations, with the, the, the bike riding group community. Some might feel that yeah, that hopefully we can show now is a bit watered down, but it was about trying to get a good feeling amongst a lot of people. So it's a 30 second ad, this is actually the whole outcome was an advertising Statewide, so some of you might have seen this. Uh, the, I'll let you know the budget was a million dollars, sounds like a lot. In today's dollars, that's probably two or three million. But all we really got was this ad to be shown about 180 times throughout the state. How to be a better driver in just three easy steps. One, give cyclists plenty of room. Two, check for cyclists. Three, Give way to cyclists. And how to be a better cyclist in just one easy step? Just follow the road rules. It takes two to tango, you know. So whatever you think of that, a huge effort went into it. And you might think that was money pushed down the train, I don't know. But that was where it ended up at. And just what I say about cans for this is, that campaign got zero support from the major daily in southeast Queensland called Kurukana. 
zero support. Whereas I think the great position you might be in is if you have a campaign, as you are having, and you've got virtually listed by name, if you can actually get, as you have got the CAMS post behind it, and if you did even get the TV stations wanting to show uh, an advert like that, which could be provided for them as a community service announcement, I think you can be CAMS, you've got the, uh, the, the capture of uh, the community that she just didn't have across the state. So sometimes we look at that ad and think it's great, but did we really get much out of it? Uh, it's hard to measure. So I'd, I'd recommend something like that to be part of the CAMS community. Yeah, and you know, I think that's one of the things we want to do before we finish is just. You know, look, you can fix a lot of these things by changing the national level and the state level. But, you know, what can you do as a community here and now? And, uh, it was making the point about small soon successful, but uh, Steve is talking about. Um, there was a gentleman here, I think, one of the main comments here. Yeah, um, I think there's a, I don't know, Australia has a statistic about the majority of uh, journeys being under two kilometres uh, by car. And 50% uh, uh, 5k or less. 30% free Okay, and, and I feel that a lot of um, a lot of cycling journeys are not being taken um, because a lot of them will be undertaken by families. They don't feel safe on those uh, inner city like suburb roads. And I see a lot of housing estates go up uh, in Cairns and wherever. Um, I don't see any kind of um, consideration for those inter suburb journeys um, through safe cycling. Um, and I'd like to know what Island Trinity Beach. Yeah, the bike bus go past quite often, and um, we're quite considering that we're always reversing uh, to our driveway, and we always look out in the morning to make sure the children don't just take any risk. Um, but I feel that like a lot of small journeys are not being undertaken because those kind of situations come up a lot, um, and cyclists feel kind of like the, the in betweens. We have to share pedestrian uh, facilities, we have to share uh, road facilities, um, and they've got you know the, the risk of doorings, they've got the risk of hard yeah. falling out. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of those small journeys are not being taken. There's not a lot of your family being involved. Your opportunities, small journeys. Yeah, yeah. Small journeys. yeah definitely. I just wonder if anybody wants to make any comment about design standards and you know why that seems to be happening. Or yeah, or is that for a truth? Um, I guess um, in those situations, in general, all road situations, when you look um, establishing design standards and trying to make specific decisions on certain functions, whether that be cyclists or, or motorists and that sort of thing. You should try and create an environment, <clears throat> and that environment is to be conducive with, with the users of the safe operation of that particular element, um, particularly with relation to subdivisions and those sorts of things. I know that there's, um, it, it depends a lot in terms of the developer themselves and, in, and, and how they want to implement that environment. You see there's different standards across the place that can be implemented. Standard. Um, some places have very good integrated path and, and bike network systems that go right through those, those subdivisions and actually uh, it's a very great choice to move cyclists to recognise that, that use. It's very user friendly and, and people see some value in that. <coughs> Others elect not to do that and basically provide a traditional road network to create that. So um, there are um, a baseline of standards I guess that, that we're quite, that developers are quite achieved and then there are add-ons that, that people may elect to implement depends upon the product they're trying to produce, who they're targeting and, and, and whether they can make some money. So we're still, we're still getting a bit of a bad work, really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, the gentleman at the back, oh, I'm oh, sorry, we can't get up before, so yeah. Yeah, um, I just wonder if it's if it's valuable for the audience here, but I, I would like to know if there's anybody here who can give us a definitive answer on how bikes and cars are supposed to interact on a roundabout, and I'm particularly talking about roundabouts that have a bike lane that uh, always exits on the first exit. Yeah. The answer's carefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, it's a, I think it's a big problem, there's a massive ignorance, cyclists and car users who just don't know how they're supposed to do it. And I think, I think that's myself included. Yeah. Um, Unless anyone has a specific answer to that question, the legal question or police, I think. I, I think, in fact, the, the bike lanes you've got in camps, and they were a bit unique, they, they were actually trialled up here. The bike lanes are only on the arm of the roundabout, normally, that is up against the, the curbing. When it gets to the exits, it no longer exists. So, in fact, when you're in that position, there is no bike lane? No. I, I, 
I commute from the city to the university and most of the roundabouts there have a, a solid white line which is on the cyclist's right yeah, and, it's con sorry. and it's continuous around and out the exit. Yeah, so if, you aren't, if you're not turning left at the exit, you have to cross a solid white line if you're using that yeah, to continue. So you are Sydney, Sydney Council yep. is able to throw the line from a legal step. Well, road rules say for bicycle riders, bicycle riders must give way to any vehicle exiting a roundabout. So the, the most common one is when a bike rider wants to go through a roundabout yeah. and a car is turning across him. Logic would say that the bike rider has right away, he doesn't. But how does uh, the bicyclist know that? Sorry? Yeah. If the car is behind you, how does the bicyclist know that? I think what we're saying here is that there, there is actually a set of rules out there. And just just for that link that we put up for the My Police website, yep. um, that has links to all the road rules. Cars and specifically for have bicycles. Have yeah. a read of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll just have it on the back of the box. So there is an opportunity to get some access to some information there. So thanks for that. Well, I just wanted to come up. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, gentlemen in the back, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, um, what I believe, uh, believe is that the biggest problem that they've got with uh, bike riders is actually seeing them. And I drive around it, uh, around cans all the time. and. You see a lot of bike riders. There's a lot that you don't see, simply because they're camouflaged, you know, like white or different coloured shirts. Why not go and make a, a rule that every bike rider, every bike, has got one of those red flashing lights on the back that they put, you know, you turn it on during the daytime as well, because when you see a bike going down the road and it's got this little flashing light out, you can see it 100 yards ahead, 200 yards ahead. You can't see these big bike, big bombs of bike riders, and very few of them have their lights, those lights on, if they've got them. And they go and spend, you know, three or four hundred dollars on a bike, spend an extra twenty-five dollars to go and buy one of these. <laughs> my, my, my bike cost me ten dollars at a garage sale. But I went and spent uh, twenty-five dollars on a set of these. A, red, a, a flash light at the back of the daytime, and one, a white one on the front that can turn on. I actually drive a sun bus for a living as well, but I'm also a cyclist. I'd just like to point out that those buses are quite large, probably uh, same width as the short truck over there. In all the years I've been driving, I've never um, had any problems with cyclists whatsoever, simply because I'm a cyclist. And a lot of the times I'll go past cyclists on that, give them two tips on the horn when they get away. The problem I have is, is there are cyclists out there also that are doing the wrong thing. But um, being, being a large vehicle, I can give a metre, no problems at all. And that's just the message that I want to put across there that. I think yeah, most people in here cycle. I also drive a large vehicle, so I'm on the other side of the fence as well. Um, in our company itself, um, if there's anyone who has done the wrong thing, um, they'll be hauled under the coals. If they do the right thing, it'll be put over the radio that so and so gave this cyclist lots of room. That's happened plenty of times. Yeah. So, what I think we need to do is educate. You know, um, some of the large vehicles, usually the big <coughs> companies, especially, um, I think it was Tonks, they pulled all the trucks aside, talked to all the drivers there, and now all those drivers, I think, have got to give way to full yeah. cyclists on roundabouts. So so education, education is the thing. Education. 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 But education. 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 Okay, look, I think we, I just want to start to wrap up. So, just at the beginning, we talked, I said there were three big themes that we heard from our speakers. One was about um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, the second one was about culture change, which we spent a lot of time 
book about the education in you know, that sort of stuff. The Hayden will change, I think, the board, the Hayden will change. And the, the third one is collaboration. Now, uh, there, is a, there is a sort of a, a, a really good opportunity, I think, here for this community. Uh, we've got a lot of people here tonight. There's obviously uh, a groundswell of concern and interest in this issue about sharing the road, making the road safer for all users. Um, and I know there are a number of different groups here represented, uh, while some of you are just uh, people who are interested in the topic. Um, and we have on the 4th of September a, an opportunity to present to the state um, uh, inquiry. So, public hearing, yeah, I think. So, I just wonder whether, it, is there, and I know that many of you might want to ask a question about uh, would you be happy to be involved in some sort of ongoing action group um, that might actually take some of these things up. So, I'm going to ask that question, and, and if you are, I think I'm going to ask you to see Nikki. Uh, Hattie, who spoke at the beginning, who's been one of the sort of uh, prime movers in, in tonight. I did, though, just want to ask Steve to talk very quickly again about the Mackay example that you gave. Um, so the Mackay example is very good. It's a group of individuals that, that, that makes up the key stakeholders, makes up the keys. Can you hear me okay? No, I tend to be working on it. The Mackay, can you hear me? Yeah, yep. there you go. The, the, the Mackay group is an interesting one. It's made up of many stakeholders, including the police, the transport department, uh, key employers such as the miners, and importantly, the community. Uh, they've been active for many years. Uh, the, the good thing is that over time they have achieved outcomes, and it comes, I think, from continually working away of what, of what become the key issues. You know, that small list, whether it's a dog point list of five or ten items, they need focus on the work. But to do that, you need a group of individuals that, rep that represent the main stakeholders. I think that's the first thing you've got to get. Second is you've got to get that list that you then focus on and then you chip away at them. And uh, their experience has shown that they have achieved some good outcomes. So I think if there's a large group of interest, it's really then moving into the next step. Who's going to take on that role of becoming that coordinator, collecting the views, seeing where the interest lies, because that requires some effort, and then slowly building that list of core things that will make a difference. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Steve. So there's a, there's a real life example of another not the similar community, I guess, in many ways, doing something. I, I did want to wrap things up shortly because you, we haven't been going for a while, so you've got like, something really on your mind there. Yeah, no, I'll just quickly yeah. respond to that, and um, thanks for that input. Um, uh, as a result of um, uh, a lot of uh, activity and interest in um, cycling safety, um, there was uh, there was a meeting of minds put together some time ago, and um, uh, we formed a group called uh, FEQ Bike Safe. Now um, it's very very early days. Um, what we initially aimed to do with Bike Safe is to get the key bicycle organisations on board, like the, the, the key bike communities, which are the um, uh, the mountain bike club, the um, BMX clubs, the road cyclists, the tries, and get them all together to agree that on the key issues we're going to speak with one voice. So at the end of the day, when we go to the communities, we sound like we're organised. It is only early days. We're in contact with Barton Van La, um, who's doing some fantastic work in uh, Geelong with Bike Safe in Geelong. He's doing some terrific work. He's working alongside uh, the Amy Gillett Foundation. We're in contact with um, Amy Gillett Foundation virtually daily. Um, we have very quickly solicited support, and I have to mention these guys because they've been fantastic, solicited the support of the media. The Cairns Post is doing a terrific job, as we can see. Um, Channel 7 has um, graciously jumped on board and is supporting us quite heavily. We the Television is doing exactly the same thing. Austereo Hot FM have jumped on board. These guys are, um, have been incredibly generous in as much as um, the, we've got the one meter message out in the marketplace already and we've done that while um, emotions are running very high in Cairns and in Townsville obviously with, um, with very unfortunate, um, uh, very sad occurrence of deaths, yeah. um, which have been through. 
So it's all those emotions been running high. We've got that message out in the marketplace. But these networks have taken it beyond that. They're running out across East Coast Queensland. And I can tell you that we've got 170 odd thousand dollars worth of people <coughs> engaged right now. To put that into a metropolitan perspective, that's about 1.5 million if you're going to do it in Brisbane. If we do this in Melbourne, 2.2, 2.5 million. Yeah. Early days for FNQ bike sake, but um, certainly if anyone is interested, um, uh, we we do want more people in board, we do want more engagement. Oh, I do, I was a member of the organisation, so thanks very much for that briefing. Um, and I did, one of the things I was going to ask here, uh, I'll get to your question before we finish up, uh, just, just that there are people in the audience who are interested in getting involved more actively in you know, dealing with the issues that we were just talking about. Um, you know, this is not binary or anything, but would you like to put your hand up if you actually are interested in doing that? So look at that. That's, that's a tremendous, uh, you know, result. So I think I was going to actually ask Nikki um, to be sort of the contact person if you wouldn't mind leaving your details uh, with her before you go, if you're interested. Or then we have Hansley. Do we have a, an address that people and then email address that we can send things to? Uh, yeah. A couple of you guys are maybe not all of you would have uh, given your details to us before you came in. Um, if you've indicated yes to um, receiving further information about what we're doing, we will be getting in touch with you. Um, I have been after the FNQ Bike Safe guys for a while. It's just been wind that I've put off, uh, caught wind off. Um, but now that I have. Um, it, it seems to be um, at that perfect time where we can actually take hold of this uh, issue and work, work it together. So, so it is. Yeah, that's good. Right. So I was going to say, the way just to wrap that up, I can thanks very much. Sorry, I So you, you've got a pretty good database here, but if you are interested in doing, following up, putting your hand up there tonight, would you want to see Nikki before you go and give, you, give her your details? And John, perhaps you and Nikki could get together just to think about how that might all look and work. Um, Sorry, what was John's organisation? It's called FNQ Bike Safe. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. He's organised it, I can't do Look, there are a lot of people here who are, um, in one way or another, involved with some level of decision making in our community. I'd like to ask you to stand up if you are in some way or form involved with uh, the decision making uh, in our community. If you can just stand up and just identify yourself. So we do have you, sir, with uh, white safe. Uh, definitely white safe. So I, know, I know it's a bit uh, intimidating for a couple of them, but um, this is to show that there is momentum. Stand up, Richie. You have no choice. Do you want to find you to stand up? Curtis. 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 I'm not very political. No, no. <laughs> just to say that I am here. You play an important part in our city when it comes to West Coast. Come on, you guys, do it. Let um, people know we're here. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Are you standing on this? <laughs> just, just introduce myself. I'm, I'm the general manager of infrastructure services of the council here, yeah, uh, and we've got Helios Mister standing over there, who's my infrastructure planning manager, uh, and uh, of course with the support of Richie and, and Jones, our uh, running the Active Cans program at the moment, amongst so many other jobs. Um, good opportunity to plug. I think if you want one outcome from tonight that you can get out there tomorrow and start using the share the road. Uh, signal up the, uh, sticker up the top there. I'll pass over to Joan in a second, but, but we've just done a rerun of a new sticker. And if you can solve world, world hunger with bumper stickers, this is the next thing you can do. I think put share the road on every vehicle in hands, and it just it's yellow, it's out there, it just raises the awareness like that. There are some outside on the table, the sponsors' table. So, Joan, do you want to just quick run down on what's happening with them, or do you not want to do that? Oh, no, that's right. We've done a collaboration with uh, the Cairns Post to get all the sticks out, so they're going to be available on Saturday at News Agent. So when you, when you buy a Cairns Post, they'll be last week, would you like a sticker as well? So you will get one of those. 20, 25,000 of them? We did 25,000 of them. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't put the police logo on it. Plagiarism is right because it's not quite the same as that. It's very similar, but it's more, we're more, it's blue and yellow.
uh, we were more black and yellow, so we've changed it a little bit. We tried to get the original artwork, but we couldn't. Um, so they're available. Uh, council's going to put them on all its fleet cars. We're hoping to get the taxis. We're hoping to get like Ergon and all the big corporations to have it on their on their fleet cars, yeah, and then right. that will get the message out strongly. Thanks, thanks, Jack. I will wrap these up now. We're like, well, we're just just having come from outside and just. Once you, as a group of uh, basically a community here, you guys are really engaged in this, and you really are in a situation where you've got a community. The timing of this is really good, and I would encourage you to pursue these these things that we talked about, and what you're going to do locally to get to make a difference in this area, and pursue that through Nikki and the Morrissey uh, endeavours and so on. So, uh, just to wrap things up, I really, I really it's just really want to talk some shit. We said we go, well, is, there, is there anyone you guys in the family are all, all done? Yeah. But thanks very much for your contribution. So there's just two more things we need to do. One is draw behind your door rods. So I'm going to ask Hansley to draw that. Yeah. So there's two of these. You get the you get the drop Yeah. Do one of those things. Yeah. Everybody, get your racket set up. Thanks, Chris.